sorry to have missed um, the first part of Glimpse today, but um, I gather you've been it's been well received, and uh, hopefully this afternoon will do the same. Uh, my brief from Phil was really to talk about current themes in construction, current drivers that we're seeing, particularly in the UK. Um, my starting point is really to take a look back at some perennial issues, some perennial themes about waste and inefficiency and low productivity, exemplified in a, in a series of reports. I mean, I've just picked reports from the last tw um, 20 years or so from uh, Michael Latham's constructing the team in 94, Egan, uh, Wollstonehouse, Never Waste a Good Crisis, right through to the Farmer report in, in October 2016. In, in, in his report, Mark Farmer highlighted the, um, the issues um, that impact upon the industry. He identified various symptoms um, of industry failure, factors in low productivity. And, and you can see from the graph that um, construction productivity is effectively flatlined um, since 1994. Um, you know, for an industry as big as construction, 7% of GDP, when one industry sector flatlines, has a serious impact upon uh, the, the economy of a country as a whole. And one factor in this um, uh, flatlining performance is um, underinvestment in IT. Construction underinvests in IT. Um, you know, at about only about one percent of revenues compared to other sectors which invest significantly higher proportions. You know, advanced manufacturing spends ten times as much. And although digitization has been ongoing since the nineteen sixties, um, other industries tend to have digitized. Um, their, their businesses far more quickly. The very fragmented nature of construction has to some extent hampered the digitization of the sector. And so McKinsey Global Institute reported in, in showing the European digitization index puts construction right at the bottom. The American report puts construction just above agriculture and hunting, um, interestingly. So there's a, even a slight reverse there. Um, I've spoken at, at previous Glimpse events about some of the factors which are um, affecting the, the, the sector, you know, and some of these are much more, some of these are very generic. You know, we, we've seen an explosion in connectivity, an explosion in mobile computing, certainly since 2008, transforming how, where, and what we communicate. We've got new ways through laser scanning and photogrammetry and drones to capture reality. We, we've got, we're creating data uh, at ever faster speeds, creating new opportunities for artificial intelligence and machine learning. Social media is transforming our expectations about real-time communication and sharing. We're shifting more and more applications to the cloud. And the Internet of Things is um, <clears throat> opening the opportunity for people and devices to connect thousands of times a day. And of course, we've got the ongoing um, work uh, around the UK BIM programme, now an international BIM programme. So the direction of travel is very definitely digital. And that's, to some extent, now being reflected in government documentation um, that we've seen, in, certainly in the last four or five years since Mark Farmer's report came out, the industrial strategy um, epitomized some of the uh, objectives set out in the construction 2025 document and we're starting to see an increased emphasis on things like whole life value and the use of pre-manufactured components. The, the autumn budget in 2017 committed government, government to leveraging its buying power to support uh, modernization of the construction industry, with five departments having an assumption in favor of off-site construction, for example. And at the same time, Whitehall and the National Infrastructure Commission was urging a much more joined up approach to how UK businesses use data and, and UK government uses data to deliver economic, social and environmental good. And the construction sector deal eventually agreed in July 2018 committed government and industry to work together 
and to modernize. And that sector deal also saw uh, the highlighting of three main strategic areas. Um, government and industry would work together to ensure construction projects are procured and built based on their whole life value rather than just initial capital cost. Um, we're also going to be focused on value. So whole asset life performance um, led to documentation from the Construction Leadership Council and also earlier this year, July 2020, and um, the launch of a value, a value toolkit looking at not, not just the economic value of delivering projects, but also their uh, social and environmental impacts as well. There are also other uh, factors coming, bring, being brought to bear, of course, as well. One factor has been the response to the Grenfell disaster. The Hackett Review highlighted opportunities created by BIM and included explicit recommendations of a mandatory digital by default standard of record keeping covering the life of high rise residential buildings and digital records to be open and non-proprietary with, with proportionate security controls. And we just heard Andy talk about openness as well. And the draft safety bill was published in the UK uh, also in July this year. September this year, um, we saw the publication of a national data strategy. Now, this isn't solely related to construction, but you can see here lots of joined up factors across Whitehall covering lots of government departments. It set out five missions, including unlocking the value of data across the economy. Um, mission number one. And on this mission, the strategy says that construction is, is one of those sectors with most to gain from better data availability. You know, and if you read the detail of the report and uh, read through it, you know, this is very much a program about transforming the way data is managed, used and shared um, and looking at ways to improve coordination and interoperability. Uh, of our data, as these are some of the issues um, which cause the inefficiency and low productivity that we've been struggling with in the industry um, over the last couple of decades. And the, inf <coughs> the National Data Strategy also makes an explicit mention of the Information Management Framework, um, something which is being developed partly through the Centre for Digital Built Britain at Cambridge. Um, creating a, a UK system of trusted, decentralised and, again, interoperable information exchange that will build the platform for uh, the national digital twin. So you can sort of see the themes that are coming through from this. I started with the industry uh, efficiency and productivity, productivity challenges. Uh, the current themes which are coming through from government include the, the use of digital te techniques, Presumptions in favour of off-site manufacturing technologies, modern methods of construction and so forth. The focus on whole life value, the emergence of digital twin thinking and an increasingly strong emphasis on interoperability. So I'm just going to briefly look at those last two themes. So starting with um, the digital um, twin side of things, the national infrastructure um, Commission's data for the public good um, recommended a much more open approach to how we deliver um, national assets, major projects, national infrastructure, and was looking at ways in which government departments, industry and commerce could share data much more efficiently. And one of the um, uh, envisaged outputs of this will be the development of digital twins. A digital twin is a realistic digital representation of assets, processes or systems. And importantly, they're connected to the physical twin. So you can start to uh, um, interoperate, uh, to, uh, to interact with information in real time, interact with the physical asset in real time. Um, and the National Digital Twin takes that one stage further. It starts to securely connect lots of individual div digital twins. So you can see how the ecosystem works as a system of systems 
um, connected together. And you know that the, the the Gemini principles here include uh, a number of um, uh, areas, uh, you know, per, of the, described on the left hand side here: purposes, um, the levels of trust, and the, and the and the types of functionality are covered in this. And at the very centre of this diagram is um, openness: that we must be seeking something to be as open as possible, whilst at the same time also reflecting the needs for security. Why would we do all of this? Well, it would be to, to manage the data that we're creating through GIS and BIM and drone surveys and sensors and um, customer billing systems and all of those other things at the bottom of the pyramid over on, on the right hand side. And using this both for data management and then sense making and for decision making, giving us the opportunity to improve um, industry productivity, improve efficiency. Uh, as a consequence. So all of that data will be put to um, incredibly value, valuable purposes. I've mentioned interoperability in, in this. Um, early this year, through the Centre for Digital Built Britain um, and funded by the Construction Innovation Hub, um, <coughs> the BIM Interoperability Expert Group did some initial consultations and um, the report is available online from the CDBB website. Interoperability here means the ability of two or more systems to exchange information and to use the information that has been exchanged. Uh, again, Andy's touched on a lot of the issues about ability of systems to share information in, in open standards, open formats, and so on. Um, anecdotally, the report um, <coughs> gives the, the cost of dealing with in, interoperability problems in one organization at about 2% of their design team fee on, a, on just a moderate size project. If you go back um, a few years um, in the United States, a major report from their National Institute of Standards and Technology gave a, 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 you know, a much more mind boggling figure um, for the whole economy. So, you know, uh, uh, the, the cost of inadequate interoperability was around nearly $16 billion per year. And a lot of that cost came from the initial uh, investments needed to avoid um, issues of poor interoperability. They were issues about mitigating the uh, <coughs> the costs of re-entry of data into multiple systems, costs from searching paper archives and added project costs due to um, you know, uh, perhaps waste or rework uh, or scrapped material costs as a result of, of poor interoperability of data. And of course, then you've got all the issues that come from delaying the completion of a project or of um, delaying the or, or of um, lengthening the, the period of time in which a facility is not in normal operation. Two thirds of these costs are borne by owner operators, but that still leaves a very hefty five billion dollars every year borne by the designers and contractors who deliver built assets into our built environment. So this is one of the reasons that um, the BIM interoperability uh, expert group is, is addressing this issue. It's identified a number of work streams, classification scheme alignment. COBE, education and skills, IFC, again, something that Andy's talked about, standards, um, the AIM, asset information management, common data environment, standard approaches to data, and importantly, procurement and contracts. These are all work streams that the BIM Interoperability Expert Group is currently working on, and we will see further developments on that in 2021. Finally, just to finish off with this week, we saw publication of the construction playbook. So this is a um, <coughs> this is guidance to government uh, clients on sourcing and contracting public works. It commits government clients to further embed digital technologies into their ways of working, embedding the UK building information management framework, um, looking at ways to deliver BIM interoperability and defining information requirements, generating and classifying data 
information security and data exchange standards. So you know, this is the direction of travel for government and where government goes, many other major client organizations soon follow. So you know, this is really one of the big themes that we're dealing with today. Thank you very much.